all for coming. Uh, what we're celebrating here is the, the the spirit of people working together and collaborating to do something they really believe in. So that's that's what's happening. It's not about the source code, and this is one of my pet peeves: is everybody talks about this and then immediately launches into the source code. And uh, it's kind of like talking about Wikipedia and arguing about PHP that it's written in. You know, there's there's a whole lot more to it. There's a human dimension, and there's a lot of innovation that went into it. And the, the social engineering, the software engineering, the, of, of bringing the physicians in on the, the picture, and this has been lost. Um, we, we've suddenly it's all about IT professionals and software engineering processes, and we're, we've ignored. Uh, the human connection. Yeah. So that's what we're doing here. And then also the people who work on open source software aren't always appreciated by their management, shall we say. <laughs> <laughs> no, tell me it's not true. Yeah, I, I still have my $75 check that I got for doing Vista from the VA. Uh, no. <laughs> I, I cashed it. But I did get undemoted. They demoted me and I undemoted and uh, the $75, it just made my whole career. <laughs> so the point is is that uh, there's a lot of effort and, and uh, uh, good stuff that happens, again, uh, not out of uh, success or not, out, not always appreciated by the powers that be out of the hierarchies, but rather the peers. So it's an award ceremony. It's to recognize people for their contributions over the years. And we also have some VIPs here. Um, First of all, Ted O'Neill was the founder behind all these ideas, where we'll be announcing an award based on him. But his granddaughter, Carolyn, is here. Ah. She's a writer, and she's going to, when she turns 16, become an intern at the Washington VA. <laughs> <laughs> The expose. So she's learning about networking and uh, business relationships, but uh, anyway, so that came out of our conversation this evening. Uh, Carolyn's father, John, here, John O'Neill, represents the family. He'll be talking later, too. Um, the, award for the, the award for the longest uh, journey to get here is for obviously the, our contingent from Jordan. Thank you very much for coming. really heartwarming to see our ideas uh, spread that way. And, um, well, and there's, there's lots of other VIPs here, but I, I can't recognize everybody. So uh, let me launch into the uh, State of the Underground Railroad address here. And it'll probably be over in less than three hours. But, uh, <laughs> you know, but I, I think what's going on here is, is the spirit behind Vista. Everybody likes the name. We've uh, produce a product that's created a very wonderful long-term longitudinal database for 32 years now of data, millions of patients, hundreds of thousands of people have contributed uh, information to it. It does work. It won a recent uh, a poll of 18,000 physicians of one of the uh, leading user interfaces going. Uh, it is alive and well, and it needs to grow. And uh, if you look on our little logo here, it's called the file manager is the engine, and then there's the thing called ADTS is the first car. S stands for scheduling. Yes. So that was a hot topic 32 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so now, if you look at it, you can blame the computer for not upgrading itself over these 32 really? years. <laughs> and the darn language didn't make darn. itself better, you know? It must be a mumps problem. Uh, so mumps is a dead language, and um, and the alternative is I was told that in 1980. The, the alternative is that we have a dead management structure <laughs> that hasn't fixed it in 32 years. And you know, bureaucrats love to blame the computer. Well, the computer made me do it. So uh, in any case, uh, it's a hot topic, and uh, I, I think. If George Timpson were here, uh, he could talk about the uh, scheduling system. Uh, he wrote the original one. I think apparently it is still working there. But it is amusing to see how much people blame the computer for uh, management problems. Um, my observation when I first came to the VA at Loma Linda in 1978 
was that everybody in the bureaucracy wanted things centralized below them and decentralized above them. So wherever you go, there's a sliding anchor point. <laughs> so that anchor point is slid all the way to some place between 810 Vermont, the White House, and Capitol Hill. And it's turned into a mega centralized, top down, you know, Congress knows best and the subcommittees can decide which language to use. Yeah. Um, the alternative, though, is medicine is going the other way. It's going to personalization, it's going to precision medicine, it's going to genomics and metagenomics, and it's gone way off the other way. So medicine, outside of the reality distortion field of the Beltway, is going into the micro and smaller and smaller, large-scale, fine-grained network of information and social networks and genomics and all these things that are going on out there and we're seeing an ever more centralized approach. And one of the more interesting things was from Doug Martin, another old timer here today, he talked about what they found at Regenstrike, <laughs> is that docs like to use a free text searching of, of notes. Uh, they don't need to use the, the hard-coded codification things, and the ICD-9 code for you know, being struck by a duck is a specific code. You can actually type struck by duck as a search term, and if that was a relevant <coughs> you'd find it. So what we're seeing here is a transition to a Google-like context-specific association of information as opposed to attempt to the one correct way to define the standards. And as we're finding in medicine, for example, the medicine by body part, you've got colon cancer and, and breast cancer. Genomically, they are much more closely related, and it's a genomic issue, not a, a body part issue. But if you have a body part codification system, suddenly you have to undo that in order to get to the genomic version. So why, why do that? Why predefine all these categories when you can create an open space and then superimpose categories if you want? So if you have the space of information, you can overlay your categorization. If you want to use a Dewey Decimal System to find stuff on the web, you can still do that. But you can still do open search. So start with the openness. Start with the contextual associative model, and then drill down to the hierarchies. You could build hierarchies however you like, eventually. So what's happening here is, um, I've drawn these pictures before, is we're spending so much time trying to integrate all these pieces, uh, I call it the Humpty Dumpty syndrome. You break it all apart and you try to put it back together again, and you wonder why the parts don't fit together. You better pay more money for more integration, for more point-to-point -point program for problem uh, solutions. As opposed to saying, let's open it up, let's loosely couple, and allow this associative Google-like way to, to link data, and move into the uh, genomics and the social networks and the precision medicine and things like that, and allow that innovation to happen. So I call that the associative avalanche. And I saw that happen in the early days of the web uh, with the domain name system. Suddenly everybody wanted domain names, and a domain name was a hot thing. As opposed to having your own proprietary network, you wanted to have Amazon.com as a domain name. Suddenly there was great value in the association and the scaling of the information, as opposed to the stove piping and integration crunch and trying to put together all the pieces in the old way. So what we're seeing here is this curve where exploding costs of, quote, integrating the systems into this uh, maintaining the sunk cost of yesterday and sooner or later, we're going to say, oh my gosh, we could scale. We could let go of all this, this integration crunch and move into a very high scale, high productive, high value, dynamic system. And that's what the domain name did to the Novell networks and the proprietary networks of old. So I predict we're on the, the, the cusp of, of uh, exploding scale and exploding productivity, exploding value through, through what we see happening elsewhere, through Facebook, through Google, through LinkedIn, and things like that. So that's, that's part of the underground struggle as far as I'm concerned, is, is building that associative, context-rich relationship and the technology to allow that happen. And an, an avalanche, you know, it, it's a matter of being poised and you can come through with a, a pinprick and make the avalanche go. You can't go around to snowbanks and poke them with pins to see if it's going to avalanche or not. It's, it's a time of being poised for things to happen. So I think we're poised now for, for something much bigger and much better to happen. And I think the Underground Railroad, uh, through our history, through our predilections and our, uh, our uh, independent spirit, shall we say, 
is poised to make a big difference there. So, so that's the state of the underground. Uh, to make the, another comparison, in 1978, how many people were in Oklahoma, Rob? A dozen? Fifteen? Mm -hmm. So we're overfunded. Is there a traffic light there yet? What now? Is there a traffic light there yet? Or that? No, Oklahoma City. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, so we, we've got 38 people tonight, and uh, we're probably over overfunded for this project. But uh, <laughs> but I mean, it is a matter of vision and a small group of people working together and collaborating. And uh, we've shown that it can happen once, and uh, I look forward to happening again. Might not quite work the way we hoped or wanted to work, but it'll it'll take off.